Hello and welcome to the Formidable Over 40 podcast. I'm Sarah Pittendrig, a mum, award-winning entrepreneur, cancer survivor, mentor and coach. In series two of the podcast, we're sharing new stories along with the ethos that you are never too old and it's never too late to design a life you love. On this episode, I'm joined by novelist Georgina Moore. From being an award-winning book publicist with years of experience in the publishing industry, Georgina followed her dream to write fiction. Her novel, The Garnet Girls, was published in February 2023, set on the beautiful beaches of the Isle of Wight. The Garnet Girls is a powerful story of sisterhood and home. So let's get stuck in to hear more about Georgina, her work and her writing. But before we do, please do rate and subscribe to the podcast so I can share more stories like this on the Formidable Over 40 podcast. So welcome, Georgina, to Formidable Over 40. It's a joy to have you. Oh, thanks for having me, Sarah. Oh, it's an absolute joy. So I've given a little bit of a, a hello about you to our listeners mm-hmm. uh, and viewers on YouTube, maybe. Um, would you tell them a little bit more about yourself, who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so for a long time, I've worked in publishing. Um, I started off, just to give you a little background, I it was always books for me. Mm. I was one of those uh, nerdy readers back in the days when children weren't distracted by screens. Mm. And I was just always reading. And I used to scribble stories all the time in notebooks, the way you do if, you're, mm. if you love stories. Um, and I went to do my, I did my English degree. And after that, I sort of wrote these ridiculous letters, now I realised, to publishers saying, will you make me an editor? <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't really know about any other jobs in publishing. And um, the boyfriend I had at the time said, oh, you, he, I was driving him mad. He said, you should go and work in a bookshop. So I went to work in a bookshop. That In those days, we had a book chain called Dylan's. In yes. fact, in fact, we had a lot of book chains, uh, yeah. but now, of course, we only have one high street bookseller, Wolstone, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and it was on Chiswick High Road, and I had the most fantastic time. And when I was there, I said to someone, I saw an event with an author, and it was a kind of like party, and they gave a reading and a chat, and I said to someone, I said, who, who does that? Who does all that? And they were like, well, that that's publicity. And I was like, it was like a light bulb uh-huh. moment. You know, I was just like, that's the job for me about books, but also using my, you know, I love being with people. I like events. Mm. I like parties. I like telling people about stuff. And that was it. I sort of went to work uh, at Hodder and Stoughton and worked my way up to kind of being a communications director, running a team. Um, but there wasn't much time, as you can imagine, in a job like that for writing. I was, mm. you know, traveling all over the country with authors, going in and out of festivals, doing quite a lot of celebrity books. I looked after Hillary Clinton for her memoir, Lauren Bacall, lots of big sports stars. So it was yeah. a fantastic job, but it didn't leave a lot of time. So I kind of was putting off something I guess I thought I would do when I was, you know, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Fantastic. And I mean... <clears throat> we talk about being formidable over 40 and, you know, I've, I share about the ethos of the podcast. It's mm. about you're never too old and it's never too late to design a life you love. Mm. And you've pivoted in midlife into to, to writing your novel mm. and, you know, we'll come to that. Yeah. But what do you think of when you think of a formidable over 40? What, what does that mean to you? Um. Lots of things, I think. I, you know, I, I have a, as I'm sure lots of us do, have um, some amazing girlfriends who really astonish me with what they're doing. Um, some of them putting together portfolio careers now, which mm. is just a wonderful. I think everyone wants to be more flexible, don't they? Since yeah. COVID, I think COVID actually has many advantages for for women of a certain age, uh, especially mums. Um, maybe I'm an older mum. I had them when I was sort of late thirties. Mm. It's been an incredible revolution to my life, really. That there is no longer so much this expectation that you would travel all the time and be commute and be in the office and have to mm. be physically seen to be doing your job. So it's changed a lot of things. So I think formidable over 40 for me is just seeing women adapt to the new opportunities that are mm. finding things that they really love and making like, like portfolio careers, putting together the elements of the jobs that they love mm. to actually make it something that they want and that they're good at. 
and also for me it's this you know ability from the workplace which I hope is happening you do see it more and more Mm. that to understand that experience and wisdom and Mm. and knowledge Mm. it is so important and that there are women there that have it and not only that but the diplomacy skills I mean I remember I don't know whether you were the same but I wasn't very good in my 20s and 30s at playing the diplomacy no. game <laughs> I no. tried and, and I, I do th- I'd like to think I'm getting a bit better but probably people listening to this have probably just spat the tea <laughs> out if I dare stay, say that I have I do think I'm better please be kind to me I'm not I'm not quite as harsh as I was but I'm sure I definitely you didn't are. have them <laughs> yeah I, th- I think I think I, one of the things I always think that is a gate is a giveaway for being for being younger in those very difficult situations, you can imagine in publishing, you get a lot of big meetings with mm-hmm. really big management agents and, and so on and talent, talent agents. And it, it's that you get defensive when you're young. You take it yeah. so personally. Yes. You think that someone's having a real go at you. Uh-huh. And I think now I, I just feel, oh, I've seen it a lot of it before and I sort of rise above it and can keep the situation under control in a way mm-hmm. I couldn't. So I think formidable over 40 is, you know, just really... Uh, for me about women being appreciated for what they can bring Mm. and for women understanding that they have a lot to offer and of course it's the menopause factor isn't it but I mean that's a massive part of it Mm. it's been a massive change for me I Mm. like a lot of women I think found I suddenly was really anxious when when I hadn't when I hadn't been ever before in my life yeah I, I I went, Sarah, I went off driving the car. I didn't want to drive the car. Um, this is such a topic for you and I to chat I about. Know. Yeah, it was get so, it. It was so weird. <clears throat> Terrible. And, mm-hmm. and I think anyone who knows me and has known me through my career in publishing would think mm-hmm. that anxious would be the last thing I would be. Yeah. But I was, and I was leaving my keys in the door, losing things. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know what it's like if you are doing, running a lot of things. like. Yeah. I run my children's lives yes. as well. Yeah. Uh, with what games kit, what thing they're doing, yeah. and then your job, and now yeah. something else. Yeah. If your brain isn't as sharp as it was, it drives mm. you slightly mad. You it think, does. oh my god. Because you think this, you do think there's actually what is going wrong. I, we've got a, um, my, my son competes horses mm. and we've got a big 18 ton horse box and I've got my HGV. Yeah. And in, I sat my um, HGV in my early 30s and I was really confident. I sat it with a load of men and mm. I was, I think I was the only one who passed my test on that, out of all of the men passed the test on that day. Mm. And I never, ever dreamed of losing my confidence. At 38, I was put into a chemical menopause. And oh, I never man. came out of it. I, I've been in the menopause since I was 38. Mm, awesome. And like you say there, the anxiety mm. that came. And then all of a sudden, having panic attacks on the motorway driving the horse box. Why? Mm. No idea. I was really confident before. Mm. And um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing, isn't it? And it's, you, you, there's a lot to come to terms with, isn't there? There's a I... lot to come, a lot of change in midlife. <laughs> I think that's right. And a, a really good friend of mine, um, Sam Baker, has a, a really good uh, podcast too. I don't know whether you've listened to it called no, the, Sh- no. the Shift. Right. Um, and she talks about that that change, the shift up yes. a gear when mm. you've come through the menopause, you know, mm. that actually what women who come through it and maybe even find a way to deal with it. Like when I mean, I've started taking HRT and I'm not sure why it's, I waited so long, to be mm. honest. Mm. Um because they made they, it made an immediate difference to me, to my brain fog, to my anxiety, mm. all the mental stuff. It really did. But I, you know, that the, 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 there can be a shift up, um, mm. a gear back again. Mm. Uh, and for me, that's you know, it, it's kind of un- women. I think there is more understanding from the work Davina's McCall's done, yes, and everyone's yeah. done on the menopause. There is more yeah. understanding of women that we can mm. ask for help. We yeah. can ask for HRT. We can ask for ways of going through that we're not sort of managing on our own and that we will come out the other side and that we can achieve great things still. Yeah. It's not the end of our life. No, absolutely. And that, that's, that is absolutely the whole ethos and message of Formid- of this podcast, Formidable Over 40. So the, through the decades to get us to where we are today, I also love to find out where mm-hmm. my... Um, my, my guests were when they were 15 what were they doing what were the dreams what were their aspirations yeah. to, to where they are today so what what were you doing Georgina when you were sort of 15 what were your dreams and aspirations and hobbies I mean as I've said it was all about a lot about books yeah I mean I'd read I read a lot um 
and I was yeah I was I was you know I, I come from a family where a lot of a lot of concentration was on culture and mm. and and stories and art and me having a good education mm. uh, in in some ways quite a pressurized environment in terms of school and education so i suppose a lot of my life was wrapped up in that in doing well in exams uh mm. what i was going to do for my a levels if i look back um but also probably I'm just trying to remember if that's when I was being a real nightmare. I don't think it was. I think that came a bit later. I think I was a bit of a late starter on the nightmare front. Um, but yes, I think if I if I saw myself now, I'd certainly with everything with the Garnet Girls, I'd be mm. in, you know I'd be incredibly proud and yeah. probably a bit impressed. Yeah. Um, so that's nice to think of that. Mm. Um, but yes, it, it's not the easy. I'm starting. It's funny, isn't it? It's one of the things about having kids later is as my hormones have all left, I've got a preteen Daisy whose hormones are coming in. And yes, it's a funny time, isn't it? Because it makes you think back more. I've been thinking back more to how mm. I was at her age and what I just it really makes you realize how hard it is Gosh, at school yeah. at that age. And the yeah. things that girls say to each other. Why do we do that? Why do yeah. we do that? I don't also, understand isn't that. It? Yeah. You know, the little personal picky things about appearance that yeah. that actually then that you go home and think about for days on end. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going through that period with my daughter and it's been really reminding me of, mm. I, I think I found it quite tough, 15, 16. I think that's quite a tough time for a yeah. girl, isn't it? That's why I, I, yeah. it was, it was I, yeah. for me, that's why I chose 15 because I found that quite mm. a challenging, I think quite a challenging is. age. And, and I think, Thank goodness in, in my time, your time, we didn't mm. have social media. We oh didn't have that pressure. I mean, hell, what must it be like for, well, you yeah. know, you've got the daughter who was in yeah, that teenage. Yeah. I mean, to have to live through that. So bizarre, isn't it? Because I remember mm. my father used to come and find me and I'd be hiding in some room, usually <laughs> a spare room behind the bed on the, mm. on the physical landline with yes. my friend. And I'd have been talking for an hour. Yeah. Well, of course, that doesn't happen anymore. No. Uh, they don't have attention span for an hour long conversation no. and he'd go whose phone is this whose bill yeah, is this yes. like oh it's me uh but i you know we didn't have to face the fact that we haven't been invited to any parties oh, exactly. whereas, whereas now you have to see who's doing yeah. what and oh that, that's awful isn't it that I, that is one awful. of the hardest things oh because i'm that... terrible i'm such yeah. a grass is greener i'm <sighs> such an envious person as well i feel i wish i wasn't sarah yeah, i wish no. i wasn't affected but i'm always like yeah. i want to be doing that i want to be yeah. doing that i mean yeah. i find instagram hard enough now yeah, as a, as a grown-up yeah I do. I, I And I, I berate my husband. I say, look at these people. Look what they're doing. Look where they are. Look where they're going. Yeah. Why are we not doing yeah, anything? Why, do why are we sat here? Our time is precious. We can't waste it. Look at I those do. people. <laughs> you and I sound very similar. I do that. And J J uh, my partner, James, who's much more sensible and easygoing than me, always says, what about when we did this? And yeah. why are you always, I got that. Yes. Why are you always looking at other people and comparing yourself? So I do feel that I would have found that so hard as a teenager. Yeah, I would. I, I, it would have been horrendous for me, knowing how insecure I was as a as a 15 year old teenager, mm -hmm. uh, feeling that life was a bit tough to start with and feeling you know bullied and so forth at school i think to have seen or have yeah. to have played through that probably feeling sat at home and feeling isolated mm. i think that must have just been horrendous it was better just to sit at home and not know what they were doing like oh, you said so you much know, better. Just, just not <laughs> the other you're missing out on the other thing i'm really glad about is that there was no social media during the early days of my publishing career because <laughs> That's something we can all count our blessings for. Oh, um, there's no God. record of uh, the way I was carrying on, because um, back, you know, back at the back in those days, you know, publishing was a whirlwind of sort of parties, yeah, and yeah. Uh, so I'm very glad of that. I escaped that. <laughs> you managed to you managed to escape the the, the photos, the videos, yeah. the bloody stories, and the TikTok. Oh, oh my goodness. God! So let's chat about your um your publishing career then sure. first because obviously I want to get on about your book but let's yeah. talk about your career in publishing first you've you've touched on um some of the the authors who you've dealt with mm. you know and who you've worked with um 
amazing. You know, you must have had come across some most fantastic people with fantastic stories to share and, and, and books to, to, to write and publish and do. What, what highlights? Who, who, who've been the highlights? Any, any particular standouts? I think probably one of the biggest highlights was Lauren Bacall. Mm -hmm. um, any of your younger listeners might not know um, mm -hmm. who Lauren Bacall is, but Lauren Bacall was a Hollywood great. I mean, mm -hmm. she was a 40s film star, like 40s film stars, like you imagine they should be, with the, yeah. the high-cut cheekbones, the dusky, drawly voice. Um, and she was actually married to Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. Uh, so she did a memoir and she was in her 80s when she was coming and I was told I was going to look after her but not only was I told but I had to go and be auditioned in Paris oh. by her which was absolutely terrifying yeah. and she managed to make every line she said sound like a sort of terrible kind of terribly brilliant line in a movie <laughs> um, and it was kind of a love-hate relationship right from the beginning because I was quite... <laughs> I was able to cope with her, but I was quite cheeky and I wasn't going to just be stamped all over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was off later in life. I was often given more difficult authors because of that ability to just kind of, you know, yeah, not be stamped on. And um, she just I had to go and wake her up every morning in her in the suite of her hotel. Um, and, you know, she was traveling without help and she was a legend and she but she was 80 and I'd yeah. have to get her little dog Sophie who she'd come with and walk her dog and she'd always have a little really really cross message for some for me to ring down reception at the hotel and everyone on reception would give me really sympathetic looks as I came in in the morning <laughs> and she'd say things to me like where are my jewels <laughs> so then I'd have to kind of go around looking for them and, and it was and then it's just to give you a short idea of the kind of things she came out with I when um, we'd done all this PR and she'd been on various TV shows and she'd been on Parkinson and, and I we were in the green room and she was always fantastic when she would have a like little vodka on the rocks after something let her hair down and uh, she I said something like oh I'm gonna jump off the cliff if we're not number one and she went can I watch <laughs> so she wasn't offering you a parachute then no. It was kind of like that all the way, and she she was so brilliant because talk about oh. being formidable over forty, unbelievable. Oh, God, and she yeah. got so cross with me because I was in a period I must have been thirties, and I was in a period of wearing very, of course, post COVID I can't even remember how I did it, but I wore really high heels everywhere. It didn't uh -huh. matter where I was going, and I was going through a fishnet. I think fishnets were in, and she was like, "Why are you were so fast?" running around and she was so cross because I was running around in these heels really fast and she'd had to get her orthopedic shoes and she was just cross about that because she wanted to be wearing fabulous heels she was just someone who was never going to in spirit she was always yeah. going to be a young person so she yes. was fantastic oh she sounds oh like my ideal woman definitely a woman to have a, a vodka or a gin with yeah definitely <laughs> so we've got to talk about the garnet girls i am saving this for my holiday i have not read it yet oh, I, I am taking like it, it with me um for the benefit of the listeners mm -hmm. um will you tell us about it tell us I... all about it how you came up with it everything sure so as i i've already told you i you know probably thought I would write something and I didn't I was busy um and then lockdown came and so many elements of my job just went out of the window the traveling the late nights I'm not very good Sarah at being one of those people that goes to bed uh, early or leaves a party early so that whole side of my life just disappeared overnight and I had a lot more time and I kind of felt it's now or never mm. um and I also had the hell like so many parents up and down the country of doing um online schooling which was just the worst and i so i started to get up for the first time ever in my life because i'm just not an early riser normally i started to get up at five or five thirty, and i started to write the garnet girls and it became this sole bit of the day that was just for me mm. that was all about me and nothing to do with anyone else and the whole house was asleep and it was just lovely and mm. soon it came that if i got some words down and i was happy with them i was sort of bolstered for the rest of the day and yeah. what was ahead of me trying to do my job trying to teach the children and all that and i think what had triggered it was um, we have a houseboat in the Isle of Wight and it's been very much for the last 
10, 11 years, our happy place where the children grew up on the beaches and we'd go there whenever we can. And it's sort of, it is our holiday place and, mm. and it's beautiful. And I'd seen a big house. They have these truly gorgeous old houses right on the sand, mm. which obviously is lots of people's dream to live in one of those. Yeah. And I'd seen this family coming out of an old house on the beach, all going sailing together. I was just fascinated because I was a Londoner born and bred by yeah. this idea of, you know, a community, a close community mm -hmm. where everyone knows your name and where, you know, it's happened to me now because we know quite a few people now on the island where you go for a dog walk um, along Benbridge Beach. And by the end of it, you sort of collected 10 people and loads of dogs and you're all yeah. chatting. It's so nice. Um, but I wanted to explore about what it'd be like to grow up in that community and what it would mean um, for you for some people it would be something nice but for some mm. people it would be something maybe a bit claustrophobic yes. and restricting mm. isolating so, maybe. Isolating, mm. exactly so that was that was the trigger the idea of where it all came from and mm. then in lockdown as i said i was just getting up early and getting it down before the day began and i began to feel that some of the things that i'd heard authors say along the way of my career in in author talks and stuff were true and I'd always sort of slightly doubted them but it's things like authors always say in, in those talks oh well you know the characters just go off and do their own thing and um, actually the characters became so real to me the three mm. girls and, and Margot the mum that they did sort of start to take I mean it's very much a character led novel Mm. Um, the plot lies in the characters. Um, that's the kind of novel I really like to read. So I basically wrote what I really like to read. Um, but they did, they started to become these characters in my mind. Um, and so then I got to the point where I was really, really pleased to be back with them like they were friends. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely, isn't it? And um, so being on the other side of the fence then, um what what's it like because obviously you've always been on the other side of the fence so which side do you prefer being on now then it's it's really it's been quite strange and it's mm. it i'm not sure you know it's only the book's only been out five weeks or something so i'm not sure i i you know have really taken you know taken it all on board it's been a world and we i got we got onto the sunday times bestseller mm -hmm. list mm -hmm. uh it, it's had wonderful response everyone's been so generous with quotes and reviews um i've done a lot of events and i've loved it mm -hmm. um i think that you know i couldn't make a judgment now on being a writer because i've been incredibly lucky i mean i have also worked hard but i, I have been, yeah but wow. i have been incredibly lucky with the way my first novel's gone it doesn't always mm. happen that way um so i think you know i need to take a few knocks and have a bit more experience under my mm. belt to say what life as a writer is really like um, yeah. but yeah I've, i have to say i've loved every minute <laughs> Have you, did you do a two book deal? Have you got another book coming on then? Yeah, but you can imagine how hard that is now yeah. because we're not in lockdown. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So and I'm still doing the day job. I still, you know, I'm still at Midas doing PR. I look after Maggie O'Farrell's PR. Um, I work on lots of arts accounts. Um, mm. So uh, I think I'm going to have to rediscover the joy of the early morning. Um, I might have to restrict my social life for a while. <laughs> oh dear me can you, can you do that <laughs> <laughs> might have to <laughs> and um doing that and you, you know sort of pivoting and taking that leap if you like to mm. the other side um how did you feel about that did you have any wobbles in terms of confidence you know uh, oh yeah many of our listeners are often held back by you know yeah. self-limiting beliefs and they say, oh, and then, but once they've done it, they say, oh, I wish I'd done it years yeah. ago. Well, um, I think it's similar to the, similar to what we were saying about anxiety with the menopause. Yeah. One of, one of the factors of me finally going and, and getting a referral for H, HRT was that I realised there was so much good stuff happening with the book, but yeah. I wasn't able to enjoy it because of the anxiety around it. And yeah. I just, that was one of the tipping points actually for me, because I just thought, this is ridiculous. This is like mm -hmm. a lifelong dream. It's dreamy what's happening. Yeah. You need to be able to enjoy it without doubting yourself at every step of the way. Yes. So that's the big element. I think what was really hard is, you know, people will rightly think that I had advantages which I did uh, mm. as someone who knows lots of people in publishing. Mm. Um, I knew authors to go to for quotes. I knew who the agents were. Yeah. But it, it was also, there was also a stress involved in that because, of yeah. course, 
when you're putting yourself out for out there and you're a public figure in publishing and everyone knows you, mm. you can't do a dud job. I mean, it would just be way too embarrassing <laughs> for, for starters. Mm. So my agent, Kath, was brilliant because I said to her when I sent her the draft of um, The Garnet Girls, I said, I'd really like to work with someone on it in Curtis mm. Brown before we send it out to publishers because I mm. don't want us to just, just rush it out. Yeah. So I did a lot of work um, on it. And when it did go out, I was really proud of it. And I yes. knew I knew it was in tight shape compared to how. And, and so I felt OK. It didn't mean, though, that I wasn't completely like, you know, like an, an author who I revere, like Patrick Gale, who I'm really good friends with, you know, waiting to hear what he thought. Mm. Just was like sitting there. Ah. But as a few of those nice responses came in and I knew they were genuine, that's the other thing, because I've worked in the industry a long, I, I would know when people were lying to me as well. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. um, it's quite easy to tell. Yes. Um, so um, after a few of those came in, I began to relax a little bit, but I don't think I've ever really properly relaxed actually no. about it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I don't think that's a bad thing because you don't want to, you know, I don't think I, I think you need to, you know, be aware of you, know, you have to keep on working hard yeah. and being grateful for what you've got and not expecting everything to fall in your fall in your lap. I think that's yeah. the thing. But, yeah, yeah. I, I still get I still, you know, if someone writes something about they didn't like one of my characters or something, I find it really hard. And quite a few people have been quite tough with me, really good friends and just said, you're going to have to rise above it because the more yeah. people who read it, well, the more. Well you yeah. get different reactions yeah. yeah um so i've got to get i'm gonna have to toughen up about that i can resonate with that i i, I co-wrote my memoir with eleanor mills and oh i love eleanor mills yeah well, i mean this is how i knew about you through eleanor mills oh was it right yeah. well um so we co-wrote my book the i can yeah. method, which is yeah. my memoir and then the, the strategy yeah, yeah. breakthrough and it was oh god it's such an emotional, personal thing, writing a book. Yeah. And, and it is that, what will they think? And, you know, at the minute, it's just about to go out on like a publicity PR sort of stunt, you know, for, yeah. for people to go out and read it and give us more feedback and do. And I'm just dreading, I'm just dreading it. I'm thinking, oh, what are they going to say? Because at the moment, I'm in a real comfort zone where yeah. everyone's very, very gentle and I've got lots of lovely five-star reviews on yeah. Amazon and Get sending me lovely messages and everything but it's now coming out to the wider community yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, so. i think i think you know in a way it, it it's part of the success of something isn't it because mm. if you think about it you want to sell it you want as many people to read it uh -huh. but as it goes wider as the audience yeah. goes wider inevitably you're going to come out of your five star comfort zone yes. because you're going to people and also i think it's quite hard with anyone who's writing a debut because you know, you don't have an audience who know what to expect. No. Mm -hmm. You have an audience who, and you might, and they might be an audience who've been misled to a book, you know, so you mm -hmm. might pick up the Garnet Girls, for example, and think it's a nice gentle saga. <sighs> it's a very pretty jacket. Um, yeah. I actually think the jacket does a brilliant job of hinting at darker things because they're yeah. facing away. And yeah. you've got, but, but you might come to it thinking that and then realise that it's quite punchy. It's quite, mm -hmm. um, you know, the characters are very flawed. Yeah. It's quite a lot of sex. There's, you know, it, there's yeah. hard life knocks that happen yes. to those girls yeah. from alcoholism to marriages ending to, you know, cancer to, I mean, it's just, it, you know, Have just you been because... copying my storyline in oh, my book, we've got cancer, we've got adversity, we've got it's life, isn't it? It's just life. <laughs> it's but I, I I feel really strongly that you know there can be this snobbery around commercial fiction in publishing, yeah. and I feel really strongly. I think well, I was lucky enough. Someone said to me that they thought the Garnet Girls was um, escapist, mm. but not sentimental. Mm. and you know when you're just starting out you don't really have a clue what kind of writer you're going to be but I thought mm. oh I like that and I sort Definitely. of pin I pinned it to my board because you can write escapism you can write glamour and the Garnet Girls are quite glamorous yeah yeah uh, but that doesn't mean that you're not dealing with real issues and mm. uh, and, and you know heartbreak and so on yes. and so I really hope that I've kind of got the balance between that in the Garnet Girls mm -hmm. and I you know people say oh you 
happy to be called a family saga. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely thrilled. Want to tell as many as possible and hear from readers and you know so I, I i think it's quite interesting that but yeah debuts and you pushing yourself out there that's very hard um yeah. especially it's when it's memoirish isn't it mm. as well that's really hard it was very hard but i definitely didn't want i knew i didn't want to do a self-help book that was mm. just not what i wanted but by sharing the memoir yeah. through the decades and so every and it, there's been something big through every decade it was to inspire people to read it and go oh that resonates with me and then how did she get out of that then because that's where I am at the minute mm. and then at the back of the book that's where we've got you know the breakthrough strategy in the book you talk about you know real life problems and mm. you know, there is adversity in, in everyday life I don't yeah. believe anybody no matter what social media tries to tell you that they live in this perfect bloody life no bloody hell, no um in terms of adversity mm. would you say that there's been any point in your life where you would say you've felt adversity and you've had to really sort of you know pull yourself up and and and, and push yourself through it oh yeah I mean without a doubt mm. um lots of things really lots of things um heartbreak mm. uh leaving relationships were, were tough mm. uh someone very close to me being ill um you know I've had been through cancer with a couple of people very close to me so yes I you know a, a lot of adversity and I think what surprised me is I, I try to be quite I mean I, I certainly was before the menopause or bit quite an optimistic person but I think the combination of going through some stuff seeing people ill and mm. the menopause it's almost like a veil is lifted and you yeah. see the world in a much more sort of doomful way that mm. I think I feel much more that life is very short that yeah. you know illness and I mean I'm sure you're the same but so many friends and are going through stuff yeah. seems like I hear a different story every day yeah uh, particularly about the dreaded c word uh -huh. so I just I just um, and of course you know we shouldn't call it the dreaded c word actually because I know so many people live with it and cope with yeah. it and, and there are advances every day, aren't they? Um, yeah. in, yeah. Many, in many ways. Yeah. But um, it's just that's how, how it feels sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, and so I think I do, I struggle sometimes not to feel that, you know, that bad things are coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think anyone with a sort of who likes writing and an imagination that does and who's been through hard times can feel like that, can't they? they yeah. And I don't know whether you do this, but I, you know, I'm having a run of really good things happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, whenever that happens to me, I tend to be that terrible and start going, "Oh God, what does this What's mean? Gonna happen? What's, What's the gonna exchange? Happen? It's must be because yeah. I'm Libra and I'm balancing yeah. everything up, you well, know? I'm am a Scorpio I? and I, I think oh, I'm oh no, Scorpio, my daughter Scorpio. Mm -hmm. I think I'm very emotional and highly yeah. charged. Perspective. Or if I have a run of good, I'm like, oh, God, that's how I'm feeling at the moment. I'm feeling yeah. like, how could it have gone so well? What's around the corner? But you know. I think every people do that, don't they? I think that's yeah. just human nature. I think, normal. I think um, it is normal, and we are a bit conditioned, probably through experience. It's probably through experience um, that we had a really good run of luck, and then something or some good things happen, and then sometimes some bad things do happen. So it's probably just reality because it is um, reality, isn't it? I mean, we can't just have a run of good luck. You know, it's just it's just not possible. And in our everyday you, you know what they say the rough with the smooth don't they yeah I, I and i do think that in settling down quite recently and, and getting the book written and stuff I, you know there was a little sense of time's wing chariot at my shoulder mm. um and just you know also you know moving to maybe a different stage i mean stage mm. in my life down the line mm. uh ahead of me making a plan i think it's really important you know when i was in publishing in quite a corporate you know company with a with a big directorship on the board and stuff i had a plan b because you know the rea the harsh reality for women in the workplace is that when you get to a certain age often your employers have a plan for you and it's not yeah. the plan you want you want mm -hmm. so i i think have uh, my advice if you were asking me my advice mm -hmm. through adversity and through this age and i'm i've just turned turned 50 mm -hmm. is to have you know to have a plan b always up your sleeve yeah. and just be 
I, I'm always amazed. I don't know whether you are, but I'm always amazed that people aren't more aware of what's going on around yeah, them. Exactly. Yeah. You just just have a sense. Yeah, blinkers on. Just have a yeah. sense of read the room is mm-hmm. my you know, and and what way is everything going? And get out before you're pushed out, and have a plan. And then maybe go and make something, as I said earlier, about the portfolio career or Mm -hmm. find something with flexibility that will really enhance your life rather than, you know, I think that's so important. So, I mean, I tend to be one of those people that once I've decided to do something, I'm Mm -hmm. quite kind of like I go for it. Yeah. But as you know, you talked earlier about getting to that point getting to the I can point yes it's very hard for some people isn't it yeah it can be really hard to get there it is because they've created this formative pattern which is Mm -hmm. very hard to break you know and sometimes they've done it right the way through the decades Mm -hmm. and I think then I I mentor a lot of female entrepreneurs and female founders who are midlife Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems that 50 is a real wake-up call traveling Mm -hmm. towards 50 with many of them it's Mm -hmm. like They've been, they've gone along and and put up, let's say, put up with whatever the the width is. Yeah. And they're kind of heading towards this 50 pretty fast. And then they're suddenly thinking, shit, I might have more years behind me than in front of me here. Mm. Do I really want to feel like this for the for the next stage? You know, and it, this is where this wake up call comes in. And I think it's um, you know, they wanna they need to make that shift and I suppose what I'm trying to say to them is that you're never too old. You know, it's never too old. I, I had I had people yesterday on my podcast who I was interviewing. One lady had had gone on and done a degree in a, in her forties. Another lady done an MA, and um, you know, you're never too old to no. change. It's just making sure that you've you, you're in the right place, supported by the right people. You know, um, very very true. And I think the other thing is. I mean, one of the reasons I thought, feel it's so important for me to keep challenging myself and doing new things is I had, you know, my I had my kids at 38, 39. So I mm. now have an 11 and 12 year old. Mm. Um, I have to, you know, stay young. I have to mm. know what's going on on social media. I have to be aware of fashion. I have to know, you know, otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm just not in it with them I can't understand what they're going through yeah. uh, and so I have to be in the world I can't you know hide away from it and I have to stay current and I have to keep challenging my brain to stay alert and to grow otherwise yeah. I'm not going to be the you know a good mum for them yes um, so I'm really aware of that as part of it um, and I think that I think it's been proved I think now I read some brilliant scientific facts probably you've used it in your book about how yeah. you know when you're trying to stave off things like dementia and Alzheimer's mm. and all all the things that we worry about, you know, doing new things, meeting new people. Apparently, it's mm. all to do with the synapses. Yeah. Um. My friend was telling me today that if you, you know, it's a real red flag for dementia and, and Alzheimer's if you're not challenging yourself to, all the time to go out and meet new people and do new yeah. things and read new things, yes. listen to new things. Uh, apparently that is you go into the danger zone if you don't do that and that makes sense to me doesn't it make sense to you you yeah that stimulation you need that that creativity that innovation that Mm. energy and i think you know i'm 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 hearing a lot of that uh, people are feeling very lonely especially Mm. um a lot of um the female founders and women women in business because Mm. you know the, the working the way people works change so very much and so you've got some people who are now working from home and you've got hybrid working. And then you've got um, founders who are so burnt out because they've been juggling the last two, three years, you know, and, and just trying to navigate through all of this, whatever this has been, you know, and absolutely shattered and lonely and not knowing where to go and where who to turn to. And I think that's really important when you when you're in midlife. It's about having having someone to talk to and and somebody who understands because not everybody does yeah Um, I think that's very true very true it's it's about surrounding yourself with radiators and not drains but that's easier said than done because you've got to hunt these people out and I definitely think being this is why I love doing my podcast because Mm -hmm. you know I meet people like you and like-minded women who are who are doing great things and they're you know, you're ambitious, you've got that energy and that vibe still. And that's why I want people to listen to this podcast, because if they are feeling lonely and if they are feeling isolated, 
draw inspiration from these conversations, you know, and realize that you're just never too old. It is it is doable, whatever that do is, you know, yeah. if you stay stuck. Nothing's going to happen if you're not going to prepare to to feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know? I, I, if you think back, I think I said this on my WhatsApp group with my fabulous girlfriends. I said, you know, if you look back, you know, whenever it was 40s, 50s, you know, women over 40 just gave up. Yes. They mm-hmm. sat in the corner of the kitchen. They started wearing those weird smocks. Yes, they did. They? Little crochet. Yeah. Let them sell, just fix, overnight just stop oh, worrying about their nails, their hair, their, you know, everything. I mean. Rinse if they were lucky. Exactly. And, it, you know, you re, it's just amazing, actually, because I, so I, I said to my girlfriend, um, one was going off to sort of run a seminar. I was doing a podcast. I said, we're not doing badly. If you think, if we yeah. look back and compare to what was happening, it was just, yeah. you were, I know we do talk about being um, invisible, hmm. um, but that is often re- that's re- in reference to men, isn't it? Yeah. But we're not invisible, you know, and that you know, never mind them, and yeah. we're not invisible to each other. Um, yeah. And back in those days of the smocks and the knitting, <laughs> that we we the, you were a woman was invisible to everyone over body. People yeah. probably even just would come into the kitchen, start a conversation and completely ignore because you wouldn't have any opinions because you haven't gone anywhere. Yeah. No, no, it's so true. I mean, we I mean, goodness, like you say, if you look at what we're doing now to I look at what my great granny or my granny would, would oh. be doing at my age. 50 was old. It was old. You were thought, you know. Well, well, what was your great granny doing at 50? Well, I would imagine my great granny at 50, she would be. She'd be cooking, running the home, running the family. Yeah. You know, she would, uh, yeah, she was the, uh, yeah, just, and, and the village, she lived in a village, you know, village yeah. community. So she was in the Women's Institute, the WMI, yeah. the church, choir, the church, yeah. you know, all of those. The daughters. community. That was, her, that was her thing, really. But not really, yeah. It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? You would never have careers, really, like. You know, no. I'll be I'll be aspiring to take on a second career in our fifties. No, but you know what I'm not sure about is why do we all still have to do all the domestic stuff as well? No, absolutely. <laughs> that's the thing we really need to get our heads around. That, that's um, I just don't. I just uh, that's uh, crazy. We'll not go there because that could be a whole new. I know. Open, I won't talk about that. Worms. That could be could be directed. Right. I'm at- I'm really lucky with my partner. He um the father of my children. We're not married, but yeah. he um he does all the washing and yeah. Well, I, 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 to be honest with you, I, I, Eleanor and I were having this conversation yeah. uh, last week. Was it last week or the week before when I was in London? We did a panel for International Women's Day, and we were just saying how important it is to have this support yeah. network when when you're doing you know when you're running businesses. You know, mm. it doesn't matter which side of the fence it is, whether it's your husband doing it or you doing mm. it. But if you're going to be the breadwinner, you've got to have a really good, mm. strong support network at home. And I'm lucky as well. My husband does all the washing. And like last night, I didn't mm. finish the work till late and dinner was made, you know, and it, that is mm. important as well. And I think, you know, that's something important for women listening to this. If they're saying they haven't got time, mm. pardon the pun, they need to get the house in order. I you know. Agree. And if people aren't stepping up, why? There's a lot of time. I mean, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure when people say well, there's not enough time, what people are doing with their time. That's exactly it. What I are mean, you doing with the time? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I the, the stage I'm at now is I often get to 10 or whatever and fall into bed and I'm literally <laughs> out like a light for okay. six hours or whatever. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I guess I'm using every moment of my time. Yeah, cramming everything in. I mean, I am I'm trying. trying. I mean, I still manage to cram. Well, I didn't yesterday because I was on podcasts all day, but most of the time, I still manage to get in a really good three mile dog walk. Oh. And if best, I can get to. Oh, we haven't it. talked about dogs. What dog have you got? So we've got um, a Dalmatian and a Lurcher. Oh, lovely! And now, did I see Bomber and yes. Border Terrier? Yeah, I've got a Border Terrier Bomber. He's here now, yeah. actually. Oh, how him. fabulous! Um, but yeah, he's wonderful. Um, and I love a dog walk. 
I love, yeah. that's my favorite thing to walking him yes. on the Isle of Wight beaches is wonderful oh, but yeah. he's great because he's always pleased to see me and uh, yes. it doesn't shout at me like some other members of the house yes he's, and, and he's sometimes my favorite child to be honest yeah yeah <laughs> I think my my dogs can be my favorite humans very often somebody said to me I was a guest on a podcast the other day or the yeah. way around and they said what do you prefer do you prefer animals or humans <laughs> I said well hmm I said, I said, I can say that animals haven't let me down as much as humans. So I said, it's a, it's a fine line. <laughs> it's a fine line. Yeah, they're never going to let you down, are they? No, they're just so grateful. And when I get home, they will be so happy to see me. They'll be wagging their tail where other people might be saying, oh, what's the day? <laughs> Brilliant. So we're coming to the end of this lovely interview i've so enjoyed it um and thank you ever so much for your time i always ask my guests if they would be very generous to pay forward some advice um so if we've got a midlife male woman um and they're sort of thinking god now i've listened to that interview i really do want to you know try and create this reinvent myself for want of a better word you know break free get unstuck Mm -hmm. Get away from this crossroads. What would you? What piece of advice would you give give to them? Is the is the the first thing that they need to do? I guess they just ha- you know one of the things they have to do is believe it can happen. Mm. Um, and also maybe if it's, I mean, I was lucky. Well, I don't suppose it's luck actually because I've just probably that's the way I've crafted the the way my path has gone. But I was moving into something that a world I really knew. And that wasn't always great because sometimes it held me back a little bit because I knew how difficult it was and how mm. competitive and so on. But I, I, you know, I would say do your research, whatever you're about to move in, you know, mm. it's obviously going to make a lot more sense and be easier for you if there is some already existing, uh, you know, link. Yeah. Um, like you know you taking you know or taking something that's happened to you and turning it into a strength like you taking the memoir elements of your life adversity and making something positive out of it I think as well doing your research you know um, I I I remember sitting down with someone uh, a friend and and talking about plan b or plan c whatever you've Mm. got to stage in life and having a strategy and really thinking about your life as it, as you would with your business brain, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. some people don't do that, do they? Just really yeah. think, think if I was, you know, strategist planning out my next move mm-hmm. here, what, what would I do and what would yeah. I research and who would I approach and yeah. get advice, mm-hmm. get advice. So again, I, you know, I, I, I'm so lucky in that I know some of the really talented marketers and publicists in the business and Mm. when I don't want to moan on to my own poor family or talk talk about what we were just talking about people being mean about you on reviews or whatever I have people I can go to who can give me good solid sound advice yes I think it's finding the people in your life as well what did you call them they're not energy zappers they're the opposite the radiators and drains you want to be Creators. Mm. Yeah, I have this um, brilliant friend, Casey, who's friends with Eleanor Mills, which is why I know about your podcast. Yeah. And she is just one of life's absolute. Uh, I think I know Katie and yeah. she's just a sort of joy. Yeah, she's a Absolutely joy. So she's, um, yeah, Katie Bond. Yeah. She's, she's, she's been a pub. She was like, she employed me actually in publishing. Yeah. Yeah. And she's just such a play it forward woman. Yeah. And um, she, she really was, helped me with my book as well. She's yeah. Been, she's absolutely brilliant but she is the kind of person so i'm you know i was discussing about you know how do i balance this next stage of my life with her Mm, between my job and wanting to be an author and and she was just brilliant because she was kind of like she was refusing to see that there were any obstacles in my way for having what i want and 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 you need people like that in your life Mm -hmm. who give you that kind of bolstering can do attitude and you said it didn't you you said friends Friends who have the right energy That's what you need. are necessary at this stage if you're going yeah. to do something out yeah. there. And yeah. also with my, my lot, probably think as well, they like to squash me quite a lot when I get too full of it. <laughs> <laughs> they're also really good at that, right? We've heard enough out of you now. Shush, shush. Right. Yeah, just be quiet. So I think, that's, <laughs> yeah, I think that's very important too, uh, that you have people real, making you realise that you're being a nightmare. 
Yeah. Um, but yes, I so I think energy around you mm. can do. I love your thing about get mm. your house in order. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, yeah. make sure you've got support at home. Yes. Um, I quite a few whingy i've got a lot i've been so lucky i've been invited to all the kind of, you know the festivals that go yeah. through the year mm. and i don't want to say no to any of them mm. but i'm also aware i've got a family home and a lot of them are at weekends so uh -huh. i just had to make sure that i'm taking the family with me on this journey yes. uh that they're happy about it and that they're behind mm. me yeah. um and that they treat it because i think sometimes with something like writing you probably come across this people think it's just a nice little thing you go off and do yeah. to hide away from people yeah but actually if you're making it into your career people have to sort of take it seriously as yeah. a job mm -hmm. and not go well it's just your writing you did it in your spare time no yeah, um so you best. have to carry people with you i think on your next yeah. stage and make sure they're all behind you yeah, no, that's absolutely. That wasn't so one piece of advice. It was fabulous advice. It was absolutely fabulous. It was exactly what I wanted. So all I can do, Georgina, is thank you so much for giving up the time because I know you're incredibly busy. Um, wish you continued success with your fabulous book. If for people on YouTube, this is The Garnet Girls. Um, where can people who want to buy this and learn more about you find out and buy? So I love independent bookshops mm -hmm. and there are lots of independent bookshops who will have it yeah. uh it's also in waterstones mm -hmm. uh it's in sainsbury's right uh it's a good price in sainsbury's mm -hmm. uh it's a good price on amazon mm -hmm. uh it, it, it it's been brilliantly supported by uh, bookshops and booksellers are very very lucky so hopefully not too hard to find Mm -hmm. fantastic well all i can do is thank you for listening to the formidable over 40 podcast thank you so much to the brilliant georgina for joining us head to the show notes to find links to connect with georgina and get yourself her book follow the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes and please do subscribe rate and share formidable over 40 with anyone you think will enjoy it or needs to hear it <laughs>